Well, it's true to say, isn't it, that the end of something can make a big difference to the whole thing. What do I mean? Well, think about it. How many stories, how many films, how many TV series have been ruined by a bad ending? A bad ending can taint the whole thing. The classic one recently was a series called Game of Thrones. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, Far too much sex and violence and all that sort of stuff. But it was virtually national news that the end was so bad, was so atrocious, that people ended up hating the whole series. They previously sort of liked it, loved it, Uh, And they hated it because of the ending. I'm sure you can think of other examples. Perhaps it was one of your favourite TV shows or stories. But the end matters. It affects everything. Most of the time, obviously, we don't know the end of the story. We don't know what happens until it happens. But as we look at Ezekiel, Ezekiel stands in a long line of prophets promising Israel and Judah that the end was near. And in Ezekiel's day, it really was. Five years after this prophecy, which is helpfully dated earlier on in the, in the book, five years later, Jerusalem would be utterly destroyed by Babylon. That's the end he was describing. The temple demolished, the people exiled. And Ezekiel himself was an exile from a previous invasion by Babylon, which had not destroyed the city of Jerusalem, but deported many of its inhabitants. And Ezekiel now is telling them of the end that is coming. And as we've been seeing over the past few weeks, he does so in a variety of ways, some very strange. This week, we're looking at two together under one heading. Otherwise, the end of Ezekiel will never come. Uh, It will take us all year. But Ezekiel tells them of the end. And not just them. Everyone must know. That's really one of the big messages that we'll see this morning. Everyone must know. But as we think about that, bear in mind that actually we are included in that. We read this uh, after the uh, reading, didn't we? For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So these things were written to the Israelites, but they were written for our instruction. They have something to say to us about the end And how we are to live in light of that. So let's dig in our first point. All will know. All will know. This is looking at verses 1 to 7. Do you remember that song uh, at school probably? We sang it at school anyway. Go tell it on the mountain. Go tell it on the mountain. Yeah, yeah. I won't say. Don't worry. I won't put you through that. It was a school assembly favourite, wasn't it? Well, this one is not so cheery. It's not go tell it on the mountain. If you look at verses 1 to 7, it's go tell it to the mountains. So verse 3, thus says the Lord God to the mountains, to the hills. He's to proclaim this to the mountains. And I've never really thought about what a strange request this was. Not only is he to preach to inanimate rock, which is strange in itself, isn't it? Let's face it. But he's also to preach to inanimate rock that's hundreds of miles away. It's not like he's even in Israel that he can stand in front of a mountain. He's in Babylon. But he's to pronounce to these mountains what will happen to them in the near future. Now, mountains in those days were often sites of pagan worship. The high places that are mentioned in the book of Kings and in Chronicles are literally high places. They were on hills. They were on mountain tops. Sometimes they were in woods as well. Uh, linked with certain types of trees, like oak trees. You find remnants of this still in in British culture, where we had similar ideas, so touching wood and things like that, or special uses of mistletoe, which grow on oak trees. Woods, and especially woods on hills, were considered spiritual places. You can often see people on the Shevin doing weird things, can't you? Uh, Every so often you just sort of come across them in a clearing somewhere. I imagine for a similar reason. But all of these, says Ezekiel, will be torn down, not the Shevin, uh, the, uh, the high places that he's talking about here. They're to be torn down. Not in a sort of national revival every so often, every few years, they would go and they would take these high places down when they turn back to the Lord. But it's not a national revival, it's a national destruction. They would rid themselves of these high places. Um, or, well, they wouldn't. They wouldn't rid themselves of these high places, so God himself will step in and do it for them. 
The altars they've been using to worship other gods will be profaned by having the bones of the dead put around them. They'll no longer be fit for use. All of these will be torn down by the invading army. But there is a purpose to all this. Have a look at verse 7. And the slain shall fall in your midst, and you shall know that I am the Lord. You shall know that I am the Lord. This is actually part of God's self-revelation to his people. It's a massive, terrifying act. And it's picking up on language that was used during the Exodus. So in Exodus 6, verse 7, I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. It was to the Egyptians too, Exodus 14, 18. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Or Exodus 29, 46. They shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. God there acted in mighty ways, mighty acts of judgment on the Egyptians, that the whole world might know that the Lord is God, that they might know who the Lord God is. And God now is saying, I'm acting in the same way with a mighty act of judgment, that the world might know that he is God and that his people might know that he is God. And the Lord repeats that seven times in our passage this morning, really to hammer it home to them. He wants them to know who he is, that he is there and that he's not to be trifled with. So what is it that they've done so wrong that's bringing these great acts of judgment on them? Well, point two, it's idolatry. All will know that because of idolatry, God is doing this. This is verses eight to 14. I imagine if I went out in the streets of Otley and asked people what they thought the most serious sins were, I wonder what answers we'd get. For those who didn't just laugh the question off, um, I imagine it would be, you know, things like murder would be high on the list, physical and sexual abuse would be there, stealing. I don't think many people, uh, many people would say um, idolatry, the worship of idols. I wonder if they ask the same question in church, though, whether the answers will be any different or whether we just go with the world's answer. Now, there's, of course, there's a sense in which all sins are, are the same. There's no sm sin so small that it won't damn you. And there's no sin so great that it can't be forgiven. That's true. Sins are all symptoms of the same disease, indwelling sin inside us. It's the disease that's the killer, so to speak. But there is a special place in the Bible for idolatry. It's right there at the top of the Ten Commandments before all the others. Now, don't hear me wrong. It's not like the Ten Commandments are sort of run down of seriousness. You know, by the time you get to number 10, it's not really that important. But idolatry underlies so many of the other sins that we commit. It's when something or someone takes the place of God in our life. Or when those things stand alongside God as an equal. Most of the time in Israel's history, they didn't abandon God. They just added other gods alongside him. He calls it in verse 9, whoring after idols, chasing them as though they were illicit lovers, cheating on God with other gods. And God calls himself here broken. Do you see that in verse 9? Broken. You've broken me. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? It's speaking like a grieved, a husband grieving at his wife's adultery. The word he uses there is the same word as he uses for breaking down their altars. Broken, the same word. So God is not some distantly unmoved being over there. There's a sense in which he's heartbroken by their spiritual adultery. A theme we will turn to again and again in this book. They have turned aside to other gods, idols, as their god. And yet they should be his alone. God had given the same verdict on the northern kingdom uh, through the author of two kings. When he wrote up why they were going into exile, he wrote this. They set up for themselves pillars and asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. And there they made offerings on all the high places, as the nations did, whom the Lord carried away before them. 
and they did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger, and they served idols, of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this. That's what happened with the northern kingdom. That's what had sent them away. That's what they'd done. But why? I don't know if you've ever thought of that. Why worship idols? Why go after other gods? It can seem so detached from our own experience, can't it? But idols were more often than not a means to an end. If you wanted more children, you'd pray to or worship a fertility idol like Asherah. If you wanted more rain for your crops, you, you wouldn't thank God for harvest like we've been doing this morning. You'd go and pray to the rain god, the storm god, Baal. You'd often just be pursuing your own ends and your own goals, which the idols represented. And the Israelites thought, well, yeah, God's good. You know, it's good that he's there, but I want this. So I'll go to a, a specialist god for this. I'll go and speak to them and pray to them. Now, I think in the 21st century in the West, we've got beyond that superstition. But the principle of idolatry remains the same. It's when we put other things above or alongside God as our ultimate goal uh, or our ultimate end in life. When we do that, we have an idol, whether it has a name to go with it or a statue to go with it or not. Tim Keller, the New York pastor who died last year, did a lot of thinking about this. He wrote a lot about idols. This is what he uh, wrote. When anything in life is an absolute requirement for your happiness and self-worth, it is essentially an idol, something you are actually worshipping. So it's worth asking that question, isn't it? What is my absolute requirement for happiness and self-worth? What is my goal in life? Is it a happy family, great career, bigger house, the easy life, romance, leisure, health, desirability, holidays, the approval of my peers, popularity, fortune? None of those are bad things in themselves, but they're not God, are they? They're not the living God that we're speaking about here. What does it mean to worship them when we don't have little statues there? We don't have little shrines or worship songs to, to health or popularity. I think we've got plenty of songs about romance in our culture and holidays as well. I thought that was an interesting one. Quite a few songs about holidays. But we worship these things as we make decisions that favour them and not God. When we choose to spend our time, our money, our precious headspace dreaming about these things when those things belong to God. We build our lives around these goals and not God's goals. And unlike God, these things are a terrible taskmaster. Tim Keller again is what he says. What many people call psychological problems are, uh, uh, are simple issues of idolatry, perfectionism, workaholism, chronic indecisiveness, the need to control the things, uh, the lives of others. All these stem from making good things into idols that drive us into the ground as we try to appease them. Idols dominate our life. He's not there saying all psychological problems, but some psychological problems that we have. These things cannot take the place of God. They turn us into slaves when God wants us to enjoy the freedom of sons and daughters. So how do we turn idolatry into worship of the true God? Well, there's a sitcom Caroline and I have been watching. Uh, and one of the characters is sort of lost at one point, not physically, but sort of lost in life, don't know what to do. And they come across another character who says this to them. Even if it sounds completely crazy, what do you want to do with your life? It's a good question, isn't it? How would you answer that personally if you're sort of thinking to yourself? Well, surely if we're a Christian, it should have something to do with God, shouldn't it? If God and his kingdom really are the most important thing in our life, shouldn't our goals have some sort of reference to him? If God's not number one in importance in our life, if our goals have nothing to do with him, then in what sense are we living as a Christian? Surely if something else is number one on our list, then it's the idol that we've been talking about. 
Anyway, the advice that was given by that character, they said, right, think of what you want in, in life. And they said, whatever that goal is, then every decision that you make from here on out should be in service of that goal. Every decision you make should be in service of that goal. So we worship God when we build our life around him for his praise, for his glory, for his goals, and not ours. Even our very selves can become idols, can't they? As we seek to live for ourselves rather than for God. The Israelites, though, in our passage, they won't let go of their idols. So God tells them that he will get rid of them for them, including for some of them, their very selves. We're told here that God will bring disaster, calamity, trouble upon them. That's when it says that God brought that evil upon them. Disaster, calamity, trouble, that's how it's translated elsewhere. They have committed evil, so God will bring this evil down upon them. Again, it's another sort of play on words. It's not saying that God is the author of evil. But even they will recognize that this is their fault. It says that they will be loathsome in their own sight over what they have done. And then they will know that he is the Lord. Then they will recognize the Lord's hand in this, but not yet. Not before the disaster comes. So God tells Ezekiel to to show this very visually. He tells Ezekiel in verse 11 to clap his hands and stamp his feet. Now that's not the beginning of the miniature hero song. If you've ever done miniature heroes, they start with a song about clapping your hands and stamping your feet. This is probably clapping your hands more in the way that you're supposed to clap. You know, you know when you try and catch a fly, and I, I try and do, I never manage it. I don't know if any of you guys have it any different. It seems to be able to know that you're about to do it. It's that idea of sort of clapping your hands like that, the way you do it to get a fly. Stamping the feet is supposed to be like trampling down. He's to do that to show them the awful future that's coming upon Jerusalem, upon the house of Israel, all the way from the bottom to the top, from the wilderness to Riblah. The rest of the Bible has Dan to Beersheba, but Dan at this point no longer exists. The northern kingdom has gone. The Danites have gone, but the whole land is taken up. And when he does this, then they will know that he is the Lord. They'll be left in no doubt that those foolish idols are nothing like the Lord God Almighty. That day is coming, declares the Lord. And that's our final point. The day approaches. Now, this really is taking up the whole of chapter 7. We didn't have it read before, but it'd be good for you to have it open in front of you as we go go through it. Chapter 7 expands on that last part of chapter 6. It's almost a poem. And it starts off by speaking of the end. Let me just read to you the first few verses up to verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me. And said, O son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, an end, the end, has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end is upon you, and I will send my anger upon you. I will judge you according to your ways. I will punish you for all of your abominations, and my eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity. But I will punish you for all your ways, while your abominations are in your midst. Then you will know that I am the Lord." That refrain keeps coming all the way through, and he repeats it in different ways. So it starts off by speaking of the end. The end has come, the end is here, the end has come on the four corners of the land. That end then, in verse 5, becomes it. Behold, it comes, it comes, it's the end. Behold, it comes, your doom, the end. And then in verse 7, it becomes the day. And it carries that all the way down to verse 22. The day is coming. The day is coming. And the day is described in various ways. A day of tumult in verse 7. A day of the wrath of the Lord, verse 19. This is what Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Jonah, Zephaniah, Obadiah all call the day of the Lord. When the Lord would come in mighty judgment. All their wealth, he says, in which they've trusted, all the idols that they've clung to, all the pride that they've had to save themselves will be gone overnight. God will take away their idols, what they sought from them, the abundance, their land, their very lives. 
And it's really quite shocking imagery. The, the trinkets and the treasures that they've been spending their lives chasing will be worth nothing in that day. Jerusalem is going to be besieged. And we're told that the buyers and the sellers will mourn on that day. I mean, can you imagine owning a shop in a siege? If you're sending something like high-end goods like coats, who wants to buy a coat in the middle of a siege when there's no food to eat? What can you even sell in a shop when there's nothing to sell? When the only things that are needed really are food and water, but there's nothing to give. And you get this amazing picture of verse 19 of them throwing their gold and silver on the ground. Because what is it worth now? You can't eat it. You can't drink it. May as well throw it in the streets. It talks about them blowing their trumpet, which was normally a sign they were going to go to war. But there's nothing they can do. They're stuck inside the city. No one's actually going. There's nothing they can do in the face of this. This is absolute disaster and humiliation. They're pictured like doves moaning. No threat to anyone, just sort of sat on the hill. And the temple, his sanctuary, referred to here as his beautiful ornament, as it talks about there. What they've been using to puff themselves up in pride. Oh, look at us, we've got the temple. Well, God says he's going to give it into the hands of others. They had twisted the temple itself into a monument to themselves and their own ingeniousness. They put idols even in the temple. And so God will destroy even that, giving it over to robbers and wicked people, he tells us in verse 22. And then after all that, Ezekiel is told to forge a chain, like the chains that you put around criminals in prison. The people in the land are criminals, says the Lord, and they deserve to be treated as such. They're taken prisoner for their violence and pride, for their idolatrous holy places, we're told. And God tells them he will bring the worst of nations upon them, the scumbags of the world, to take away their homes. Seeing those thugs, they'll try and make peace. But there will be no peace in that day, only disaster. They'll seek a prophet to tell them what will happen, what will happen. When they should be seeking the law, which already told them all this was going to happen in advance. They don't need fresh revelation. God has already told them everything that they needed to know. It's a bit like nowadays when someone says, Lord, Lord give me a sign. Should I lie to this person? Should I commit adultery? Should I steal this idea from someone? Give me a sign, Lord. But the answer is standing right in front of them in the Bible. They don't need a sign. They need to do a search on Bible Gateway, don't they? That's really what they need to do. But all of them will despair in that day, we're told. All of them. And all the evil that they have done will land back on their heads. The day of the Lord will come. And again, though, this is not just a message for them. Because we too await a day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the one that this one in Israel looked forward to, when not just the four corners of the land will be affected, but the four corners of the earth. 2 Peter, oh, sorry. In 2 Peter, it says this, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burnt up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. The day of the Lord is coming and it approaches uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It's coming with no warning, none that we can discern. No one knows the day or the hour. Jesus says in Matthew's gospel, for as were the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the son of man for in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So how do we prepare for something like that? How can we prepare for the day of the Lord? Well, straight after that passage in 2 Peter, this is what it says. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? 
We prepare for the day of the Lord by letting go of our idols now and living for God. We keep ourselves from idols, as John says in 1 John. We keep turning away from idols to serve the living and true God as the Thessalonians did. All the while calling on others to do the same. So we need to let go of our idols of comfort and an easy life and live for him. All the way through the New Testament, we're told that time is short. We don't know how long we've got, but we're told to stay alert and keep working for the kingdom. Worshipping God with the whole of our lives and not getting distracted by other things. What do you need to let go of that you might prepare better for that day? That you might live for him more fully? Israel wouldn't let go of their idols. And so God took those idols away. He took them away that they might weep over what they had done and turn back to him. Do we really need to take it that far? Some idols, of course, are a bit more tricky. We don't need to get rid of them. We shouldn't get rid of them. But we just need to stop them being our idol. It'd be lovely to say, work is my idol, I'll just stop working. It doesn't really work that way, does it? But instead, we need to make sure that we love Christ more than those things. Family is my idol. We can't go and live as a hermit, can we? It just doesn't work. No, instead, we're to love Christ more than those things. It's as much of a lack of love of Christ as it is an overlove for those things. We don't want to love our partner or our family less. We want to love Christ more. We need to dethrone those idols, not destroy them, and put Christ back in the right position. If you've never come to Christ, if you've never put him on the throne, what is it that's stopping you? What is it that you need to get rid of to come to Christ? What is it that's more precious in your life than him? What's more important than knowing God and avoiding that judgment to come? Is your idol really worth it? The end of something can really make a difference to the whole thing. And we see here the coming day of the Lord should make a difference to how we live now. Christ should be number one in our lives, even before that day comes and reveals that, that truth to everyone. I'll leave the last word to Tim Keller. This is what he said. The only way to free ourselves from the destructive influence of counterfeit gods is to turn back to the true one, the living God, who revealed himself both at Mount Sinai and on the cross, is the only Lord who, if you find him, can truly fulfill you. And if you fail him, can truly forgive you. Well, let's pray that God would help us to live for him alone. Let's pray. Father God, we're so sorry that like the Israelites, our hearts can be so fickle. Father, that we can so easily put other things in your place, that we can so easily value other things above you. Father, pray that you'd help us to think through this afternoon, perhaps think through over the coming days and weeks, what it is that we uh, have in our lives as idols or are in danger of becoming so. Father, help us instead to turn to you, to love you more. And Father, put Christ on the throne. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>